Welcome to this tutorial explaining exactly what frequency is, where it comes from, and why it's very important to understand. If you are installing an inverter such as a Victron Multiplus or Quattro, you will need to accurately set the system frequency in order to make sure that the system and all its connected loads are properly in sync with the grid, allowing them to run optimally and safely without damage. With that said, let's continue with this tutorial. All right, so how exactly is frequency generated in a current? Well, to better understand where frequency comes from, let's kick things off by exploring a basic AC generator and how it drives a single phase circuit. Imagine we take some copper wire, turn it into two coils, and set these coils opposite each other inside what's called a stator. We then connect the ends of these coils to make a complete circuit. Now, if we introduce a magnet between these coils and start spinning it, the magnetic field from the magnet will interact with the free electrons in the copper wire, and that's when we start to see an electrical current flowing. Before we do that, let's first take a look at how a basic magnet works and why it forms these oval-shaped magnetic field lines around it. As we know, a magnet has a north and a south pole. The polarity flows out from the north pole into the south pole in a continuous loop as illustrated by these oval lines. The first thing you should notice about these lines is that they are not an equal distance from one another. The distance between the lines gradually increases as they move out towards the perpendicular sides of the magnet's central axis, where they are less dense. This density of lines is more accurately known as the flux density, which simply tells us how strong the magnet is at any point. With this in mind, we can conclude that the flux density is higher at the two poles, meaning that the magnetic strength is the greatest in these areas as well. Conversely, the perpendicular sides of the magnet have the least density of lines and therefore the lowest flux density, meaning that the magnetic strength is the weakest in these areas. In fact, if we were to examine the magnetic field along an imaginary line down the central axis of the magnet, we would find that this region does not exhibit a distinct north or south polarity. Instead, it represents a transitional zone where the direction of the magnetic field shifts from emanating from the north pole and converging towards the south pole. All right, so how does all of this magnetic flux and polarity work in conjunction with a generator? Well, when the generator starts, the magnet's north and south poles are aligned directly between the coils, resulting in the weaker transitional zones passing over the coils. Due to its transitional nature, this leads to no impact on the coil and therefore no movement of electrons. Now the magnet starts to spin. As the magnet's north pole moves towards the top coil, it effectively pushes the magnetic field forward. This also nudges the free electrons within the copper coil forward as they start to accelerate in one direction, leading to positive voltage readings. Once the entire magnetic field of the north pole passes over the coil, it maximizes electron flow due to this area having the highest flux density and magnetic strength. But the magnet doesn't stop here and continues to rotate. As the magnet moves towards the other, opposite transitional zone, located between its two poles, the magnetic field's intensity starts to wane. This diminishes the electron flow until the magnet's weakest field, or lowest flux density, is once again positioned directly between the two coils. The magnet continues to rotate as its south pole starts to come into play. This again causes the electrons to start accelerating, except that this time they are pulled in the opposite direction, which results in negative voltage readings. This negative pull increases in strength as the south pole's flux density increases until it reaches the south pole. This again causes maximum electron flow due to the high flux density before again tapering off back to zero as the magnet returns to its starting position between the two coils. This back and forth movement of the electrons is where alternating current, or AC for short, got its name from, as the electrons constantly alternate in direction. The best way to remember this is by comparing it to how the tides of the ocean work. Low tide represents a period of stillness and minimal movement. The ocean's waters recede, creating a moment of tranquility. This phase is like a system at rest, where energy is latent and activity is at its lowest. As the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun begins to exert their influence, the tide turns and the water gradually advances up the shore. This rising tide symbolizes the gradual accumulation of energy, preparing for a significant shift. High tide marks the point where the water reaches its fullest extent, demonstrating the greatest energy. The water's strength and presence are most impactful, reshaping the coastline and invigorating the ocean's ecosystem. After reaching its peak, the water starts to retreat. This phase represents the release of energy, a period of decline where the intensity of forces decreases, moving the system back towards a state of calm. The tides follow a predictable changing pattern, driven by the gravitational interactions between the Earth, Moon, and Sun. Each phase of the tide, low, rising, high, and falling, contributes to the larger cycle, illustrating the continuous rhythm of nature. 
Analogy aside, if we were to plot the electron flow speed during the magnetic field's rotation on a graph, we'd end up with a sine wave pattern. When the generator starts and the magnet's transitional zone is aligned with the coils, the magnetic field's influence on the coils is minimal. This corresponds to the zero point in a sine wave, where the wave crosses the horizontal axis, indicating no electrical output. As the magnet rotates and its north pole approaches and then aligns with the coil, the magnetic field strength increases, reaching a peak as the pole is directly over the coil. On a graph plotting voltage, or current against time, this translates to the rising part of the sine wave peaking when the magnetic field is strongest. The peak of the sine wave corresponds to the maximum positive voltage, or current, generated. As the magnet continues to rotate past this peak alignment, the magnetic field's influence on the coil decreases until the next transitional zone is aligned with the coil, reducing the induced current back to zero. This point of returning to zero on the graph marks the completion of the positive half cycle of the sine wave. The rotation continues, bringing the south pole into alignment with the coil. This induces a current in the opposite direction, represented by the descending part of the sine wave from the zero point into negative values, corresponding to the maximum negative voltage, or current, generated, which is the trough of the sine wave. After reaching the maximum negative voltage, the magnetic field's influence begins to wane. As the magnet rotates further and approaches the next transitional zone, the negative voltage decreases, moving back up towards zero. This transition completes the negative half cycle of the sine wave. When the magnet's next transitional zone aligns with the coils again, the system is back at its starting point. This is known as a full cycle. We measure these sine wave cycles in the unit of hertz, or HZ for short. If you look at any of your electrical devices, you'll see that they are either 50 or 60 hertz. In fact, most electronic devices like phone chargers and computer power supplies are typically designed to operate on both 50 and 60 Hz systems. They can adapt to these frequencies because they convert the incoming AC alternating current to DC direct current and are designed to handle slight variations in frequency without affecting their performance significantly. However, the situation is different for devices that directly interact with the power grid or are tied to the generation of electrical power such as inverters and inductive load generators. An inverter converts DC into AC and must match the grid frequency to synchronize effectively with it. If the inverter's output frequency does not match the grid's frequency, it can lead to inefficient power transfer or even damage the electrical system. Similarly, for inductive loads like motors or generators that produce or use inductive power, frequency is a critical parameter. The performance of these devices is closely tied to the frequency of the supply. For instance, the speed of an AC motor is dependent on the frequency of the electrical supply. Examples of devices with AC motors in your home are air conditioners, ceiling fans, pool pumps, washing machines, dishwashers, and refrigerators. If you have a home workshop, then stationary power tools such as a table saw, bench grinder, and drill press are also inductive loads that require exact frequency matching. Operating such a device on an incorrect frequency can lead to inefficient performance, increased wear, or even failure. Therefore, when setting up an inverter, the system frequency refers to the number of complete cycles the current goes through per second, measured in hertz. The standard frequency of the electric current varies by country. 50 hertz is the standard frequency used in much of the world, including Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia, while 60 hertz is commonly used in North America, parts of South America, a few countries in Asia like the Philippines, as well as parts of Japan. With a Victron inverter, you can select the system frequency in the VE config software or within the Victron Connect app. Note that this setting also determines the acceptable frequency range of the transfer switch if the Accept Wide Input Frequency Range setting is disabled in the Grid Settings tab. So, depending on your choice, this ranges from either 45 to 55 Hz if 50 Hz is selected, or 55 to 65 Hz if 60 Hz is selected. Conversely, if the Accept Wide Input Frequency Range setting is enabled, it combines these two frequency ranges, allowing for a frequency range all the way from 45 to 65 Hz. All right, let's go back to our basic magnetic AC generator to look at how cycles per second are measured. The term 50 Hz indicates that the magnet undergoes 50 complete rotations each second. Similarly, 60 Hz means that the magnet performs 60 rotations every second. However, when the magnet rotates 50 times within one second, corresponding to 50 Hz, the coil within the generator is actually subjected to a magnetic field that alternates its polarity 100 times every second. In other words, one for each of the two poles, per cycle or second as the generated voltage oscillates from positive to negative 100 times within a single second.
Therefore, in the case of a 60 Hz frequency, this alteration in voltage occurs 120 times per second. Given that voltage is the driving force behind electron movement in creating an electrical current, these electrons switch directions 100 times a second at 50 Hz and 120 times a second at 60 Hz, facilitating the flow of alternating current. Okay, so knowing this, can we work out how long it takes for the magnet to complete a single full cycle? Definitely. In order to determine the duration of each rotation, we use a simple formula that states that T, time, is equal to 1, divided by F, frequency, where T represents the period of one cycle, and F is either 50 or 60 Hz. Let's do some quick math, beginning with a 50 Hz frequency. To calculate the time period, T, we need to divide 1 by the frequency of 50 Hz. When calculated, this equates to 0.02. Therefore, for a 50 Hz frequency, the time to complete one rotation is 0.02 seconds or 20 milliseconds. We can then simply do the same for a 60 Hz frequency by dividing 1 by 60 Hz, and when calculated, this equates to 0.0167. Therefore, for a 60 Hz frequency, it takes about 0.0167 seconds or 16.7 milliseconds for one complete rotation. All right, great. So now that we understand magnetic flow, flux density, sine waves, hertz, and cycles, let's put some voltages into the mix in order to bring it all together. For this, I am going to use a 230 volt circuit as an example. To begin, I will reset the magnet back to its starting position, with its two poles perpendicular to the coils. As the magnet starts to spin, its north and south poles move relative to the coils, changing the magnetic field through them and thereby inducing an alternating voltage. When the north pole approaches a coil, it induces a voltage in one direction, which we call positive for convenience sake even though in reality both poles contribute to both positive and negative voltages as they move relative to the coils. As the magnet continues to spin and the north pole moves away with the south pole approaching, the magnetic flux through the coil changes direction. This change induces a voltage in the opposite direction, which we refer to as negative, again, for the sake of convenience. This continuous change in magnetic flux direction, influenced by the movement of both poles, creates the alternating peaks, where we see the maximum positive voltages, and the troughs, where we see the maximum negative voltages of the sine wave. Remember that both poles contribute to both the positive and negative voltages as they move relative to the coils. The key is the change in flux, not just the approach or recession of a particular pole. But wait, why is it going all the way to positive and negative 325 volts when I said that this is a 230 volt circuit? Well, this is because during the magnet's rotation in the coil, the generator produces a voltage that exceeds the RMS value that we commonly refer to as 230 volts. This peak voltage is about 1.414 times the RMS value, which for a 230 volt supply calculates to approximately 325 volts. In other words, the generator reaches these peak values as it produces an alternating voltage throughout its cycle. These peaks correspond to the maximum electron flow in either direction when the magnetic flux changes most rapidly as the poles pass closest to the coils. However, when we talk about the electricity supplied to our homes or devices, we often refer to the RMS voltage, which is the voltage that you are probably most familiar with when it comes to plug sockets and multimeter readings. The peak and their corresponding RMS voltages vary depending on where you are in the world as follows. For the UK, after voltage harmonization in 1996, the RMS voltage is officially considered to be 230 volts, which corresponds to a peak voltage of around 325 volts. However, it's worth noting that due to historical standards and allowed tolerances, some locations in the UK may still experience voltages closer to the historical value of 240 RMS voltage, leading to a potential peak voltage of about 339 volts. The same peak voltage of 325 volts applies to most other countries using 230 volts RMS including Africa, India, Australia, and Europe. In China and some parts of Brazil where the standard RMS voltage is 220 volts, the peak voltage would be approximately 311 volts. Lastly, in America and Canada, where the standard RMS voltage is 120 volts, the peak voltage would be around 170 volts. Note that multimeters are typically designed to measure RMS voltage for AC signals, not peak voltage. The standard multimeter will display the RMS value because this value is more useful for most practical electrical measurements, especially in residential and commercial power systems. A true RMS multimeter is designed to provide accurate readings of the RMS, root mean square, value for both pure sine waves and more complex non-sinusoidal waveforms.
This is particularly important in environments where the AC waveform is not a perfect sine wave, such as with certain types of electronic equipment or power supplies that introduce distortion. However, true RMS does not imply that the multimeter can directly measure peak voltages. The primary function of a true RMS multimeter is to accurately measure the effective RMS value, which corresponds to the DC equivalent voltage that would deliver the same power to a resistive load. To measure peak voltages directly, a multimeter would need specific peak detection capabilities, which is often labeled as the peak hold or peak voltage feature. This function captures the highest and sometimes lowest instantaneous voltage reached by the waveform, which is not a standard feature on all multimeters, including many that offer true RMS readings. Although, even a true RMS multimeter doesn't typically measure or display peak voltages, it is primarily focused on providing accurate RMS readings, which are more useful for assessing the power in an electrical system. If you want to determine the peak voltage, you would need to perform a calculation, assuming you are dealing with a sinusoidal waveform. To calculate peak or RMS voltages is very simple. If you have the peak voltage and want to calculate the RMS voltage, you simply divide the peak voltage by the square root of 2. For example, 325 volts divided by the square root of 2 is equal to 229.8 volts. An alternative and easy way to remember this is to simply divide the peak voltage by 1.414. For example, 325 volts, which divided by 1.414 is equal to 229.8 volts. This will provide a measure of the equivalent DC voltage that would deliver the same power to a load. On the other hand, if you have the RMS voltage and want to calculate the peak voltage, you would multiply the RMS voltage by the square root of 2. For example, 230 volts multiplied by the square root of 2 is equal to 325.2 volts. We can again simplify this by multiplying the RMS voltage by 1.414. For example, 230 volts, which multiplied by 1.414 is equal to 325.2 volts. In other words, if you don't have a scientific calculator on hand, just remember to either divide by 1.414 when wanting to find the RMS voltage and multiply by 1.414 when wanting to find the peak voltage. Okay, so why do we use RMS instead of the peak voltage output of an AC generator? Well, the RMS voltage is a more useful measure when we want to consider the power the generator can supply to an electrical device because it gives us an equivalent DC voltage value that tells us how much continuous power the AC voltage can deliver. This effectively tells us how much continuous power the generator's output can provide, similar to a DC source. Let me explain this with a quick example using an electric heater. When you connect a heater to a DC circuit, the current flows in one direction, providing a constant voltage and current, thus delivering a consistent amount of power to the heater. This consistent power output results in the heater producing a certain amount of heat. Now, if you switch the heater to an AC circuit, the current and voltage will no longer be constant. Instead, they will alternate, varying sinusoidally with time. This means that the power delivered to the heater will also vary over time, peaking twice per cycle and dropping to zero when the current changes direction. The goal is to find an equivalent DC voltage that would make the heater produce the same amount of heat as it does when connected to the AC circuit. This is where RMS comes into play. The RMS value of the AC voltage is calculated to provide an equivalent steady voltage value that would deliver the same power to the heater over time as the varying AC voltage does. The reason for using RMS voltage is related to how power is calculated. In an electrical circuit, P power is equal to V voltage multiplied by I current. The important thing to note here is that in a DC circuit, V and I are constant. However, in an AC circuit, both V and I vary sinusoidally, so the power delivered is not constant. Therefore, the RMS value is essentially a mathematical method to find a constant value that can represent these varying values in terms of their ability to do work or deliver power. It squares the voltages, making them positive, finds the average of these squares, then takes the square root of this average. And that brings us to the end of this video. If you've made it this far, I sincerely hope you have enjoyed the content and learned something new. If so, please leave a like and subscribe to support the channel, as well as to get notified of any future videos. Oh, and make sure to check out this video as well. You can also subscribe over here. And this one is pretty cool too. Lastly, don't forget to visit and sign up for a free account at the Blue Power Pro Forum.